министр промышленности. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you all, dear friends. I'm very uh, pleased to see you all here, and I appreciate the invitation made by the organizers uh, of this event to talk to you. And I must say that the economic power of any country is defined today uh, not by the scope of production of goods and services, but by creating of fundamentally new products and technologies. The baseline train of those changes which are taking place right now, which we are witnessing right now, is that the industrial production is becoming more digitalized without paper, it's, become, it's becoming smarter and customized. The future plants and uh, works will be absolutely different compared to those which we have right now. And the changes and alterations that are taking place now, they are taking place together with the new wave of innovations, and we can witness these changes right now. And today my suggestion would be to talk about what kind of uh, advanced technologies, industrial technologies, and how they change the, and how they change the face of the global industry right now, and how this new so-called industrialization is taking place here in our country. The advanced production technologies are oftenly called uh, as disruptive ones by uh, underscoring the point that they not only they make uh, more perfect uh, the production facilities, but they change substantially the structure of the production. And the main idea of implementing them is to to produce the end product with a better quality, faster, and at a lower price. When we say advanced technologies, we mean a set of uh, processes that includes different machines, instruments, equipment, which are which are computer controlled. I think that almost all these technologies are united by the idea that they digitalize, let me put it this way, traditional industry. And the core of these technologies are software and microelectronics. Why do we pay that great attention to the new production technologies? Today we can see that the traditional and conventional markets show the annual growth of 5 to 7 percent. Then the high-tech domains like industrial internet or additive production is showing a growth of 30 percent annual and even more. I would like to give you some clear figures that clearly show a boost of new markets which are closely associated with the advanced production technologies. The analysts say that the global, global industrial automation market by 2019 will have a share, will account for 150 billion US dollars, while the market of big data in a two year time can reach the level of 187 billion dollars. The additive production industry must go up from the current six billion dollars up to 30 billion dollars by 2022, while the scope of the market of all digital, smart, and virtual works by 2035 will exceed 1.5 trillion US dollars. But this forecast clearly shows what the global industry will look like tomorrow. The market of the new materials is sector.
These are the self-restoring materials with memory effect. And they also are capable of self-purifying. And its proactive implementation also alters very substantially the economic indicators of the industrial production. I believe that many of you heard that this year has seen the first flight test of the new flagship of the Russian civil aviation, specifically MC-21 aircraft. And by the way, yesterday it uh, came to Moscow to the, to the city of Zhukovsky, and it's quite symbolic that uh, it was uh, t the 21st flight of that particular aircraft, which is called MC-21. This is the project which uh, embraced the most advanced uh, engineering and scientific uh, solutions. One of the key and specific feature of this uh, aircraft is that the wing is composed of polymer composite uh, materials. For the first time ever in the world, we have created this uh, composite wing uh, for the wide body uh, aircraft. The share of composite materials uh, in the design of this, uh, on the, of the airframe of this MC-21 uh, aircraft is up to 35%. And this is actually a unique feature, and this is absolutely second to none in its uh, class of aircraft. And thanks to the use of uh, the advanced materials and technologies, MC-21 has got a very uh, high uh, aerodynamic quality. It consumes less fuel, and it requires less costs, uh, less operational costs compared to its competitors in this sector, specifically uh, Boeing 737 and Airbus uh, uh, A320. Thanks to, it, thanks to the light, low weight, the composite materials are widely used in agriculture sector, in the railway sector, in the transport, in the shipbuilding, and uh, in the nuclear industries. And the the composite materials are capable of withstanding very uh, high stresses, and this makes their use very uh, comfortable for the production of the blades of wind uh, power generators. Uh, this one of the most promising uh, domain is the 3D uh, printing, also called the additive technologies, which substantiate which substantially alter the traditional approaches uh, to processing uh, materials. Uh, for many years, uh, for many uh, centuries, the technology in a great extent remained unchanged. A human being was cutting, uh, cutting metal, was uh, grinding materials, uh, and so forth. Or, in other words, he was trying to get rid of everything a human being didn't need to get the end product. The additive uh, production, uh, on the contrary, is based on editing uh, extra materials, specifically different uh, metal powders, uh, melt, hot melt uh, or wire, and this is the core foundation of this uh, technology. 3D printing can be called uh, one of the uh, breakthroughs uh, or discoveries of the uh, of the last uh, several decades. And this technology enables us uh, to create by adding a layer by layer uh, some materials, different shapes and forms based on the digital uh, twin. This is an absolutely new design concept which substantially uh, reduces the the time frame when the idea pop up, pops up in an engineer head uh, and up to the end product uh, in a physical uh, structure the additive technologies makes it possible to make necessary amendments at the design stage and to change the uh, scope of the uh, product to be produced and make every particular produced item a unique and customized to the needs of a particular of a particular um, user all the most so right now we are developing a technology of so-called 4.0 uh, printing. We're talking about creating a new dimension that enables us uh, to change to change uh, an item in 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 the space. We traditionally have uh, the, we, the the width, the length, and uh, the height, uh, but now we add the fourth dimension. If these ideas come true, then we will have a new generation of a 
automatically configuring uh, products uh, that uh, can adapt to the uh, climate conditions. Nowadays, additive uh, technologies are becoming uh, more uh, are becoming widely used in aerospace industry in automotive industry in engine construction in uh, the, in the in the biomedicine and in metallurgical uh, steel uh, plants for instance uh, the united engine corporation does have uh, plans to use additive technologies uh, uh, when the uh, when the company is going to produce gas turbine engines and up to 20% of the components of these engines uh, are expected to be manufactured with the use of uh, 3D printing technologies. And actually, uh, um, this technology has already been implemented successfully when uh, the PD-14 uh, engine was uh, built for the civil aviation and in the design of uh, the brand new gas turbine engine that is going to be used uh, aboard the uh, ships. The additive printing uh, is going to be used uh, for, uh, for printing certain components uh, of the Helicopter, helicopter, uh, Russian helicopter company, and specifically some uh, non-load bearing structures are going to be printed. And right now, the plastic-made uh, firearms uh, can be used, and different, uh, or different. A specific uh, bio ink uh, is being developed uh, to uh, to to create uh, bones of, uh, to to be replaced in the human body, and uh, right now. And a number of research centers is dealing with uh, these technologies. Specifically, I'm talking about the Moscow uh, laser technology uh, in the, the Moscow Technical School named after Bauman, uh, St. Petersburg uh, Techno um, Engineering School, the Tomsk Institute, and a number of other participants. Based on the NP uh, National uh, Pro Production, uh, Production uh, Association in Rybinsk, uh, the Rostec State Corporation is establishing the Additive Technologies Center over there. The 3D printing uh, is uh, is very important for Rosatom, a nuclear uh, corporation of Russia. And the first ever try, the first ever take uh, of th metal 3D printing was made in Sni Marsh. Uh, in the end of the day, we have a very um, complicated uh, item that by 10, uh, which is uh, which is stronger uh, by 10 to 15 percent than the traditional uh, casting process. Probably you know that some of the components cannot be uh, manufactured uh, in, a, in a different way but uh, by additive uh, technologies. Right now, the additive technology, so this is the new example of the so-called brand new industry, which is undergoing a digital transformation. The data which are generated uh, for the launch uh, and creation of certain items uh, can be stored on the memory stick, and this uh, will substantially reduce the operational cost of an enterprise. And I believe that the most important stage uh, of the production of the industrial items is the transfer from uh, the idea uh, uh, the idea when it's when it was born to the practical implementation and the practical physical uh, structure of uh, this uh, item. How does it look like? How the production chain, traditional production chain, look like? Uh, designers uh, and engineers uh, they uh, make necessary calculations and then. Uh, they have to uh, carry out a great number of uh, practical uh, examinations and uh, trials. At all stages of the life cycle, a great number of modifications uh, are introduced and implemented. And these modifications result in uh, the growth in, uh, in, in price. And digitalization of the industry uh, changes this system. And uh, right now, the design takes place uh, on the basis of uh, um, very c complicated and complex mathematical c uh, calculations that, ha has already be that have already been done. In other words, a design it doesn't work from scratch, uh, but uh, it works with a particular digital model. The high-tech companies in, in aerospace uh, industry, in the automotive industry, and in oil and gas machine building uh, industry, they create a so-called digital twins. Uh, 
uh, that is a, a precise uh, and similar virtual uh, twin of a certain item that is going to be produced. Why do they do that? They do that to make sure that uh, well in advance they can identify all flaws and mistakes and errors in design and to use in the most optimum way all resources which are available uh, for them and definitely to reduce uh, the design uh, design cost design cost. This is the principle which uh, is used for the creation of the submerged, uh, submer digital submerged um, production uh, complex for the exploration of the offshore uh, oil and gas fields in the Arctic uh, region. The digital modeling and designing um, actually expedites the preparation for the production. It uh, reduces the costs and uh, obviates uh, uh, different uh, angularities. Uh, these principles were successfully used in the, the project uh, called uh, a convoy uh, that were uh, a convoy for, for the uh, high-ranking officials of the Russian Federation. And only in two years' time, we've managed to uh, to create a four prototy uh, two prototypes of uh, car in four uh, different types of in four different options of uh, the uh, in, in four different designs of the um, of a vehicle every plant is going is substantially changing when the automation is introduced uh, in average the automatics uh, is a fa work faster uh, three to four times uh, than a human being where usually uh, the human labor was used right now this work is is work done by a robot a robotic systems and it doesn't make mistakes uh, it follows the uh, soft it, it follows the pattern that was uh, downloaded into the computer of this robot and this is is the actually the uh, positive effect that we can achieve uh, by uh, robot uh, robotics uh, by the use of robotics uh, ro different robot robots and uh, therefore we can reduce the risk of uh, the errors and mistakes that could be caused by a human factor and the specific value the industrial robots uh, give uh, in those sectors which are closely associated with uh, heavy and hazardous uh, labor conditions uh, for a human being. The implementation of the robotics uh, and robotized technologies is the key factor to, trans to, uh, to transit from the man-free man industry, and uh, even the most conservative uh, industries can feel the effect. For instance, uh, the no Novosibirsk-based uh, group of companies, which is called Obif Russia, or Shoes of Russia, they create, uh, this group of companies creates uh, the uh, workshops uh, where all in, uh, process operations uh, from cutting up to the final assembly of the shoes are done by uh, industrial orbits. One smart machine can replace uh, 10 can replace 10 sewers while the output of the uh, smart machine is seven to eight uh, times greater than a regular sewing machine. All the most so. Uh, robots right now can train designers, uh, technology specialists. Uh, the vehicle, uh, actually the equipment which uh, got a memory stick with the future model of a shoe can scan the information and uh, to download into the cutting machine uh, tool which will cut uh, which will cut a uh, um, a leather slab and the leather lead, and then makes, then will put all together, all components together. Not only computers or robots or materials will be smart in the future, but the entire enterprises, all in the, uh, the entire industrial facilities. And when they are get connected, uh, when they are got connected uh, to the network, and they can interact in, in, uh, with each other. Uh, when all sensors, transmitters, uh, and gauges are interconnected, then we will talk about uh, industrial uh, so-called Internet of Things. So the most important effect from implementation of such networks is almost 100% human-free from the processes. So human does not, human being does not have to be there. So along with uh, robotics and uh, robots, Industrial internet 
is one of the key drivers for smooth transfer towards human-free production and manufacturing. The whole network of sensors, gauges, and devices work as one big system. The, and human being is only the only thing he has to do is to monitor and do some corrections and adjustments. Internet of Things, I think this is uh, one of the most bright example where digital technology and other systems work together. So the number of uh, connected devices uh, will amount to from 6 billion in 2015 to 25 or even 50 billion by 2025. Just like a smart fridge can let you know if your product is about to expire. In a similar way, equipment can tell the engineer about its state and condition and uh, will show all required and relevant data uh, through the network. So everything will be connected in one network, and it's going to be enormous and very impressive. For example, experts uh, from the international consulting company called Accenture say that the overall input of the industrial internet by 2030 is 14 trillions dollars, trillion dollars. So this is thanks. This can be achieved thanks to uh, savings, to f digitalization, and optimization of business processes, switching to service model, and using traditional and conventional products, improving efficiency and industrial safety. Speaking about disruptive technology, I should talk about big data. Big data is used to achieve maximum efficiency efficiency, and it collects a lot of data. No doubt, big data analytics help achieve, in certain situations, cut costs by 5 or 10 percent. So the company called General Electric, for example, can minimize its downtime and Apple, for example, Apple company can use their own goods to do the same. Intel does the same and they don't need that many inspections anymore and tests before they enter the market or launch new processes on the market. So big data technology is actively used in banks in Russia and telecommunication. For example, Burbank uses this technology to analyze uh, data, data with respect to 135 million private and over 1.5 million corporate clients. Ross Telecom, thanks to these new analytical tools, can process about 20 million documents per day with minimum participation of a human being in this process. MTS, the mobile provider, uses big data to choose respective format and to locate or open new offices and to optimize their employees' workday. Skills are required, special skills are required to work with big data and we need to do this as early as possible from the school days. For example, in the Moscow Physical Institute, they have a supercomputer which, is, which capacity amounts to 18 teraflons, which means 18 trillion operations per second. This is a supercomputer uh, and it is connected to other networks uh, around uh, the world and across Russia. And uh, there's another supercomputer and uh, center called CERN. It's, uh, it's located in Switzerland. Also, this technology, big data technology, is used in oil and gas industry because it helps choose 
best ways to explore and produce. And uh, they also help uh, monitor drilling processes and analyze the quality of feedstock and raw materials. For example, Gazprom Neft company, thanks to big data, resolved uh, solved their problem related to uh, automated uh, restart of pumps after the emergency shutdown and power failure. So this was really helpful. And this year, Gazprom Neft started working together with Yandex Data Factory. This is uh, a branch of uh, the company Yandex. So this technology and machine learning technology and artificial intelligence will help well men optimize their drilling processes and uh, work at wells and well rigs. So uh, this is a success story of uh, Yandex Data Factory working with other companies. And a good example would be Magnitakorsky steel mill. After each melt or melting operation, they collect uh, st statistics or stats, and uh, they do some uh, chemical measuring, and uh, they get information about uh, pig iron, and uh, they also know what's happening with flow rates of different products, which helps uh, optimize costs and optimize the melting process. So big data technology is a mixture of solution is a set of solutions that help you optimize your production and manufacturing process. And Yandex, uh, working together with the steel mill, is a really good example. And we can see how IT is closely connected to other industries and areas. And actually, I really saw how it works during the NAPROM exhibition this year. We also had a session, and it was a plenary session, and uh, I asked, uh, I posed a question to the audience, and actually a lot of participants represented IT industry, which means everything is very intertwined. For example, if we take all of these uh, disruptive and breakthrough technology and put them in one platform, we will be able to see a new generation plant or facility which would be able to produce customized products and goods many times fold faster. So this plant of the future can be split well into three stages. Stage one would be would be switching all processes to digital and we will get a digitalized or digital plant. Then we will see smart plants and human being will be involved even less. And as a, as a result, if we combine the two digital and smart systems into one network, we will be able to see a virtual plant. And uh, data is transferred at unbelievable pace, which means we can build this kind of uh, plants, smart plants, anywhere in the world. And um, this smart plant might seem fantastic, science fiction, or unbelievable. But actually, the first smart plant in Russia by the end of this year is planned to launch by Rostech. It's uh, based in uh, Rybinsk. They work with a uh, Sotorn facility. So they will create a test range, and uh, they will test all best practices and uh, cutting-edge technology on practice, see how they work. And this will help in the future to manufacture complex parts for new generation engines for aviation, for aircraft. So based on this uh, breakthrough technology, disruptive technology, in Russia we are already uh, witnessing a number of uh, projects uh, related to the construction of the nuclear 
icebreaker called Arctica. This is, and also there are other projects uh, in automotive um, industry. Uh, it's called Patriot. And um, there's another partnership uh, between Kamas and uh, Yandex. So they are testing a uh, driver free bus. And uh, probably we will be able to see this during the championship, football championship in uh, 2018. Of course, uh, every new technology means change. On the one hand, uh, human-free technology and processes is a good thing because there'll be plenty labor available for other industries. At the same time, there'll be a need for new specialists with different type of skills, with different set of skills. And new systems will require highly qualified specialists and experts. So all these changes are well planned, step by step, gradually. This is going to happen. And um, new technology, new equipment means evolution for employees, because new technology, computerization of uh, our production lines and manufacturing is a good chance for young genera generations such as yourself, which is uh, really good which means there'll be more young people working in different plants and facilities. For example, back in 2013, the average age of Kalashnikov plant was 47 years old. And today it's 35, 36 years old. So there's a high demand across the country for young specialists. And uh, 976 uh, students started their education in uh, different institutes and universities. Uh, so this is a good thing. But at the same time, this uh, disruptive technology doesn't mean revolution. But it also means that it changes the ideology of the industry of industrial production. And we yet have to do quite a lot in this area. The plant of the future is an engineering center with different types of equipment, small equipment and um, additive equipment and technology. Big, num big uh, number of uh, computers, machines, and uh, you'll be able to produce anything you like with different parameters, characteristics, and parameters. The approach is also changing. Logistic is changing. Smart plant or smart facility will be will soon be able to exchange information, no matter where location is. No matter the location. Some time ago, quite recently, artificial intelligence and driver-free vehicles were considered to be science fiction and uh, it could only be seen in uh, films and books. But today it's our reality and uh, depending on the forecast, uh, some say that by 2035 it will amount to 90-95% and uh, there'll be around 20-something 20 plus million cars moving uh, around uh, the cities without drivers, driver free. So we know that we know that a lot of students have already passed successfully exams uh, on uh, robotics and relevant equipment. So. They know how to work with CNC, computer numerical contract um, control. And actually, in Dubai, the contest is currently underway, and I hope that uh, our team will show good results. So, based on the results of the exam, students receive skill passports, meaning uh, competence passports or certificates. And uh, such employees uh, like uh, Ross Atom. Um, United Aviation uh, Co Corporation and many others, they uh, 
they recognize uh, the certificates and uh, ready to take these students and employ them. And some experts even say that uh, over half of um, your generation will be working at positions which do not exist today. And probably Internet of Things uh, analytics or data analytics or smart home or something like that, or biopharmacologist, these professions will be in demand and will be very popular. But uh, some other professions, some other specializations will go away will become redundant due to development of artificial intelligence, driver-free vehicles, uh, robots, so on and so forth. But this process may go seamlessly without any challenges and significant obstacles. For example, in Sberbank, just some time ago, used to work about 33,000 accountants. And today is just 1.5 thousand accountants, and nothing will happen, no tragedy, no disaster. So further development of technology basically depends to a certain extent, to a big extent, on you. It depends on you and your generation grew up with and around computers, so you already know how to adjust, how to adapt and you know what digital technology means, so it will be easier for you to implement and absorb new knowledge and skills. So there lies ahead of you a lot of options, a lot of new exciting things. So don't waste your time and take your chances. Thank you. Should you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain all of your questions. Good morning. My name is uh, Leonid Kalechkin from Physical Institute. You were saying that additive technology will replace regular production line, conventional production line, but 3D printing can it compete with other equipment in terms of uh, speed and efficiency? Well, today, probably not, because uh, today it's uh, quite specific. And uh, on the one hand, it complicates some parts. Well, probably. I'm sure uh, in your institute, in your physics institute, you, you probably saw things like that. It's not possible to cut anything on a machine without special equipment in place. So I don't think any 3D printing be able be able to do this, something like this, anytime soon. So of course, end product must have certain properties and characteristics and quality. So the process might take some time, no doubt, before before the speed of additive technology meets certain requirements and uh, work at the same speed as we can see on different mechanical equipment as we see today. But I'm sure it will take some time, but this will come sometime soon, probably. Good morning, Piskunov uh, Georgi from uh, Helicopter Plant. You were talking about uh, new specializations. You were talking that you said that uh, something new will appear and uh, some will go away. Do you think uh, engineer, will it go away or not? First of all, I'm very pleased to see a colleague of mine here in this uh, auditorium because uh, I was a part. Uh, I was uh, I was a part of the restoration of the helicopter industry in Russia, specifically and establishments of the company called Vertolet Rossiya Helicopters of Russia. And when it comes to your particular question, I would say that this uh, profession which you mentioned uh, will remain, but. 
some elements uh, and technologies you're going to use in your in the future in your profession they will be substantially different but if we uh, talk in a broad, if we have a broad view on this uh, professional like, like engineer or designer i would say that many years ago there was absolutely different approach to uh, getting uh, education and not even an education but a title what uh, is an engineer this is a human being who is uh, capable to design uh, an item uh, from the, from scratch and up to uh, the disposal of the uh, of certain item by taking all stages of the life cycle like marketing production and so on and so forth But when it comes to design, I think this is something which is of a particular uh, grade. And I believe that uh, an engineer with a capital uh, uh, capital E will remain. By the way, what are you do? What do you do? do? Where do you work? I'm a design. I'm a designer of the Experimental Design Bureau in the lending gear and the control systems. What do you work on right now? I am responsible for modific modification of the hydraulic system. Uh, for the unsat uh, helicopter, just try to get rid of uh, uh, vibration because this is the most important uh, thing right now. And I do know what's your response regarding the unsat helicopter. And also, I'm responsible for the uh, elaboration of the uh, landing gear. I'm from Vladimirsk region. I'm the second year, uh, second year student, uh, graduate student uh, in laser physics. And I represent also the uh, enterprise called Raduga, or the rainbow, literally. People are split into two categories. There are people believing that we can uh, buy everything, every sep all, all separate components, and assemble them. And so then we will uh, enhance, we will carry out certain enhancements uh, for the end product. Or the, the second group believes that you can get raw materials, you can invest more money and time, but you can create your personal equipment. From your perspective, what is the best way? How to evolve. Well, actually, I believe that there is no contradiction between the uh, these two split groups. I think that it can be applied to different uh, sectors of the industry. If we speak about the fact that we need to produce a highly competitive uh, products with a high added value, and at the same time to to supply uh, it not only domestically but uh, to sell these products out to the global market, uh, global marketplace. We, I think that we need to have a closer look of what is uh, better from standpoint of the analogs that are manufactured in the world. If we've got enough competences uh, domestically here in Russia, for instance, uh, when it comes to the production of the fiber optics, uh, since uh, you are a laser uh, specialist, uh, then I would say that uh, the quartz. Uh, uh, that the quartz tube uh, are not produced here in in, uh, in Russia. There are only two countries in the world that uh, manufacture quartz tubes right now, uh, Japan and the United States. If we mean the national security, if we bear in mind the national security, I would say that not only we shall have uh, our own competence, but uh, the high quality production uh, shall be in our possession to make sure that we are immune from those uh, threats emerging on the market when without uh, any any foundation, it's absolutely illegitimate when technologies are banned from being supplied to Russia. Definitely, we try to find an alternative way of acquiring this, of obtaining these technologies. But when, but I believe that we shall compete with our foreign partners as equals. If we believe that there is a need to acquire some ready, ready end products from foreign suppliers, I don't think that there is a problem. I don't really think that the national uh, economy, uh, let, let's say a kind of uh, subsistence farming type uh, national economy is not our way. For instance, in Vladimir region, you've got a cover of electromechanical plant. And this is a brilliant example of the, let's say, subsistence farming type of national economy. And I don't really think that everybody should uh, follow the suit uh, of this uh, plant. Uh, the uh, director general of uh, that plant is a very uh, aggressive and very proactive man. And his uh, enterprise produces the equipment which can be used in different sectors of the economy. 
but specifically uh, it can be used in uh, weapons and uh, armament and material uh, production. And actually, even he, he, dis he made a decision to use the Japanese uh, uh, equipment for the production purposes, and he also uh, produces some equipment for the uh, public utilities. But again, we must be competitive with uh, Western uh, companies. But we should also bear in mind uh, in the economic indicators. We can produce our own components, and they give added value uh, and economic result. OK, uh, that's really good. Uh, uh, but if not, then at a particular stage, uh, we will uh, create our own competences, domestic competences, and we will acquire uh, this or that product at the global market. My name is Alexander Kostanov. I represent Irkut Corporation. Yesterday, apart from MC-21 flight uh, uh, from Irkutsk to uh, Zhukovsky in the outskirts of Moscow, there was another major event in the industry. In Bombardier, C Sirius, uh, Airbus acquired 50% of shares plus one due to the fact that Bombardier cannot sell out uh, uh, an aircraft for more than a year. And uh, they decided uh, to uh, improve the situation at the, uh, at the production facility of Airbus. And Boeing gave the following commentary on that event. It was, uh, this, the, uh, Boeing said that uh, this uh, uh, deal, this transaction, uh, in no how cancels uh, uh, the customs due for the aircraft to be imported into uh, the United States. And the fee level, the customs duty, uh, custom duty right now is considered to be 300%. From your perspective, do you think that this is a, a good example of uh, the Do you think that this is a fair uh, uh, competition or not? And what kind of protective measures can the ministry take uh, to defend against uh, such developments? I'm, uh, I'm really glad that you uh, keep track of what's happening in the world, uh, not to mention the domestic events. And I would give you the following answer. This is a very tough competition between two majors. When it comes to the Canadian uh, company Bombardier, I, I was there some five years ago, and at that particular moment, so they uh, felt uh, quite discomfort. They felt discomfort. We wanted to get something. They, they uh, some. Uh, we wanted to to buy a share uh, or uh, in that company, and uh, of course, we we can never imagine that a uh, control stake will be uh, stake will be given uh, to us. Uh, but originally, Bombardier uh, Bombardier has got uh, some French origins, and definitely, I believe that uh, uh, on the American continent, it's uh, Bombardier will fill uh, real problems uh, in uh, in terms of competition with uh, Boeing but uh, the uh, I can understand why the uh, the US authorities uh, make such a decision but it looks like the US uh, federal administration f simply uh, forgot that the the United States is still a member of the WTO but non tariff regulation measures uh, uh, may be applied and uh, I'm absolutely confident that 150 seat Cesarius uh, aircraft will be uh, let's say pushed off of the American continent. By, by the way, it's a it's a good aircraft. Uh, by the way, when we were at the final stage of design of uh, MC21, we th we were thinking of uh, uniting the maintenance uh, system uh, with uh, Bombardier. Unfortunately, in this particular sector, we don't have uh, that much competence. And actually, we, when we were developing Suhoi uh, SSJ, uh, Suhoi Superjet 100, we've managed to get an experience. And in the future, we will try to take all those errors at uh, SSJ 100 uh, in the future when we maintain MC21. But I would say that without uh, investments by the government, uh, MC21 will never uh, would have never flown. More than 200 billion rubles uh, have been invested. Uh, into of th this is a state money, and so this money was invested into the both uh, research and development uh, of the MC21. 
But can you imagine how much how how much more money will be required uh, to uh, in in the future for the promotion of these aircraft and for marketing these aircraft? And as for the Russian uh, portfolio, I would say that this portfolio is right now accounts for 175 aircraft. And as we go on, we go on. We will try to protect uh, our uh, domestic domestic uh, market. Um, please uh, be sure either me or my successors uh, as applied to MC21 uh, when a proper time comes when the uh, when the MC21 will go uh, when when the MC21 goes uh, commercial and today we discuss uh, uh, we are discussing right now that we will uh, we will n- We, when we will um, make sure that no VAT is paid uh, by uh, by the company. Right now, MC21 is available will be available will be available on the Russian market, and I believe that uh, the conditions on the Russian market uh, must be equal. And I believe that Russian aircraft operators uh, shall be in a better position to buy uh, MC21. And next week, I will travel to Latin America to promote. Uh, our Russian uh, aircraft equipment, but not only aircraft equipment, of course. My name is Ivan. I'm from uh, Komsomolsk on a more aviation plant. We're talking about implementation of uh, new technologies, but n- this implementation in aviation is impossible without legal uh, frame. And our industrial institutes, uh, um, institutes and institutions, uh, they are mostly private right now. Don't you think that at the government level we need to return to the previous uh, to tradition when uh, the plants did have a certain branches uh, at uh, different production facilities uh, during the implementation of new technologies? We're dealing with, we're doing this job right now. But when it comes to the promotion of uh, serial uh, produ- uh, produced aircraft, it's very difficult to split the production uh, of new aircraft and implement uh, and implementation of new uh, uh, technologies. Previously at uh, different uh, locations in Kazakhstan. In Novosibirsk, uh, in Irkutsk, there were uh, some manufacturers who did have the right to elaborate their road design documentation. And probably this tradition must be maintained. Don't you think so? Well, actually, I didn't know that VM. Uh, is a private company right now. Actually, I had a meeting with the senior member of the Russian Academy of Science uh, academic, or senior uh, member of the Russian Academy of Science. I talked to him yesterday, uh, and he didn't say uh, anything about uh, an institute going private. But when it comes to NIAT, yes, back in early 1990s, that uh, uh, institute went private. It was privatized, and uh, the uh, the staff, uh, the core staff uh, in this institute uh, still works, and along with Kazan-based uh, uh, Technology Insti- Institute, these two um, institutes provide development of those production technologies, these are that production technology. But as for the future, I would say that I would prefer to go a different way. Over the last three years, we have managed to uh, to establish the, uh, a number of engineering uh, center, uh, excellent center, and uh, the number of specialties uh, is 49. And in 30 uh, technology inst- and engineering schools and institutes, we have established these uh, centers of competence. And so these, this is something very similar to what our foreign partners have. Retrospectively, I would say that almost 70% of uh, plants uh, in the Soviet era, major plants uh, of the Soviet era, starting from the uh, chemical production facilities and and automotive industry uh, plants uh, and uh, up to the aircraft industries, they were built on a turnkey basis by Western uh, partners. In by 1930, uh, some countries were trying to share uh, their technologies with us, but when uh, we, when the Soviet Union nationalized the enterprises, uh, they said that we would not sell these uh, plants uh, to you and the uh, plants and works to you, but we will carry out a turnkey uh, project. So the competences which uh, we which were available in our um, expert institutes 
we, we, we don't have it. We don't have such centers of competences right now because when it comes to fundamental and applied uh, sciences and put it together uh, with the production facilities, I think that an entire cluster shall uh, comprise uh, applied science, fundamental science, and production facilities. And these engineering centers, which I've already mentioned, uh, what, when we create them, uh, what we do, we actually grant an opportunity to, to you, to students. Some of you are students, I know, and some of you are graduates already. We just try to give you a chance to understand what kind of uh, um, profession, what kind of grade you would, uh, you would uh, have in the future. And you need to understand it uh, when you are a student. It means that all institutes uh, get an order to establish, uh, get an order of what professions will be in, on, demand, on demand in the future. Specifically, uh, for instance, uh, uh, how to design a, uh, design a certain section of the Komsomolskona Mur Aviation uh, pro Plant. And we do this job together with the uh, Bauman uh, Engineering School in the Moscow Aviation Institute or other specialist engineering colleges. And together with the students of these establishments, we must design, develop and design a technology that will be implemented in the future. First of all, we have got uh, the uh, uh, with certain financial effect. It means that uh, a student, when he's still a student, he gets uh, additional uh, money. So it means that he or she will be interested in uh, going to war in going for work at that particular plant, which provided a certain uh, amount of money uh, during the education process. So uh, my. I do believe that uh, such engineering specialist centers uh, must be established. And then as soon as they uh, prove to be efficient, they can go on their own and they can they can go on their own, they can go independent and they can get money uh, from the marketplace. Okay, let's give the floor to a girl. My name is Valentina Tishin. I'm from Primorsky Cry. Uh, I'm from uh, public joint stock company Progress. We're talking about automation, that in the end of the day, the robots will work. I'm not against that at all. But the question is, my generation and the generation and, the, and an older generation, well, I understand that there will be people who, which, uh, who can change its qualification and uh, uh, specialty. But I don't really think that all people have got enough time to do so and uh, education allows them to do so. But in the end of the day, where will we come to? I'm relatively young and I can afford uh, learning. Yes, I'm young, and I understand. You have uh, praised yourself, I understand. But people who are older than me, for instance, in my company, in our company, we've still got people who cannot work uh, uh, on the computer. They still use a drawing board, so-called Kuhlman board, uh, to, de to develop their, uh, their uh, designs. But wh where we're going right now, we are going, to, uh, we're going for automation. But we're talking about the uh, lack of jobs. The unemployment rate will go high. Actually, we have banned to use at our production facilities uh, uh, the drawing boards. And when it comes to progress uh, company, I strongly recommend all of you to go there and have a look what's happening over there. Some time ago, we made a decision on establishing a, a competence center at the progress uh, regarding the casting uh, technology. We faced a dilemma whether to preserve this, or whether to keep uh, this enterprise in place or not. Uh, I must confess that uh, I was very nervous. I really was concerned about uh, that enterprise. But when all factors, including the financial and economic, coincided, we've managed to save the companies and all the more so to provide uh, uh, for a certain period of time in the future to provide a state order and we've managed to establish uh, the high precision casting center uh, over there. You understand that uh, the specialist, uh, when we made this decision, the specialist in uh, this uh, high precision casting, they were not available at the Progress company, but those people were trained and they didn't uh, invest their own money. But uh, Vertolot Rossi, uh, uh, Russian helicopters uh, holding company, 
um, provided funds, raised funds for those people. But now, when we uh, pro when we, is, we when we establish uh, the uh, pre precision uh, casting center uh, for the Russian helicopters, it was not simply enough. Not to mention the entire industry. But if we talk about young, uh, talented, uh, and uh, beautiful women like you, I don't really think that there will be any problem with uh, uh, requalification. Uh, and I do believe that you will have enough time, a year or 18 months, uh, you will be able to undergo training which is required. But as for the older people and older generation compared to you, to, to yours one, I don't really think that they will be affected by such uh, dynamic evolution. Uh, in my presentation, I, told, I, I made it quite clear that there will be a step-by-step, -step, a steady, a gradual transition from one technology to another one. If we lose uh, one specialty, then, the, then we will acquire another specialty. By the way, we, prov we have also state support uh, measures, state support program uh, which is used for paying the uh, for paying for the requalification or training of uh, uh, specialists so should we receive uh, feedback that such uh, requalification is required we would uh, provide our support to those people to make sure that they are still on the agenda dear participants uh, Dennis uh, Mantorov uh, has only 10 minutes left so just a couple of more questions Itania from India. Uh, currently, I'm studying my B.Tech Mechanical Engineering in Indian University. Uh, my question is, like, Russia is investing uh, in the sectors of, in India, in the sectors of defense, security, and uh, uh, nuclear power. Um, how it will be going to be in the future relations, like technology enhancements in the aviation of future with India? I want to say you that I'm from Maharashtra myself because I was living in, in, in India for several years, like four years in uh, those days it was Bombay, now it's Mumbai, but uh, my heart still with India and especially uh, about the civil aviation, you just mentioned about the military cooperation, the same we are planning and uh, we're really keen to have the projects in the civil aircrafts. And uh, I think you know that we signed the huge contract with, uh, uh, with India, with Ministry of Defense, for the civil helicopter K226. And uh, it's one of the, one of the basement to, to develop the cooperation in this field. And I hope other passenger aircrafts will be in the pipeline. Uh, with uh, with our industries. Thank you. Sir. All the best. Thank you. Uh, through this technology. Through this technology. Speak in the microphone. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. That's much better. Okay. So uh, I'm asking about. We have now several technologies that can be used for uh, entrepreneurs, small startups, uh, young uh, youth that can introduce some products. But how we will guarantee that there is some fair competition between large companies and there is some opportunity to introduce their products without some swallowing by the big wheels of the industry of aviation? Would you please tell from which place are you? Because I'm from Egypt, but I'm studying from, from Moscow Egypt. Institute of Physics and Technology. Okay, it's a, a good coincidence that I'm the co-chairman of the Russian Egypt. Uh, Intergovernment Commission. So we are trying to develop the industrial zone in the Port Said uh, on the Suez Channel in Egypt, and I hope that you will come to, to work in our industrial Russian zone. And I hope with your small and medium sized enterprises. Of course, it's a big dilemma always when uh, the huge corporations, they, they feel the, uh, the breed uh, of uh, the small size companies who may bite a little bit uh, the, the, the huge corporations. And there is no recipe, unfortunately, 
to, uh, to you know, to, uh, to cure the, this, uh, this disease. But I'm sure that if the small entrepreneurs are coming with the progressive technology, uh, you will find always a niche, and uh, especially in new technologies, uh, which I mentioned in my uh, presentation. And it's more secured niche for the small entrepreneurs because the big companies, they go slow. They really go slow to, to pick up the new technologies. So it's a good opportunity for you. But uh, sometimes, like, good technologies, like, can be swallowed for, uh, from the big companies to prevent these technologies from uh, going after. That's, that's, so. that's what I mentioned to you. I mean, uh, when you see the direction, uh, I mean, the huge company cannot purchase all uh, companies, the small entrepreneurs, for additive technology, for example. Some of them are definitely will survive. So I hope that uh, as, as more you will look forward the technologies, you more secure yourself from the big companies. Good morning. My name is Maxim. I'm a student, and uh, you were talking about the future industry. I think that it's like global world, international platform. For example, in uh, Europe, we have Airbus company, and uh, all countries, European countries, work together and all companies from European countries work together. So do you think um, or do you know if Russia has any plans to go on a, to anti-European market and uh, develop, develop other relations? Where are you from? Uh, no. I'm from France. Okay, very good. Well, we've been working with uh, Airbus company for three years, and uh, we were hoping that our colleagues, our colleagues, uh, well, actually, they were they owned about seven. Air, actually, Russia owned seven percent of uh, seven percent of uh, Airbus, but actually, we were not pre represented uh, in the board of directors. But um, there's a technology, and um, sometimes it's best if Russians don't, don't know certain things. And we actually wanted to develop our relationship and to work together. And actually, Irkutsk representative is here. And I think they're still producing some or manufacturing some components for Airbus. Is that right? Yep, they still are. So, for example, in Titanium uh, Valley, in Sverdlovsk, they produce uh, some parts for Airbus, for Boeing, for Embraer, and for Bombardier. But um, to a certain extent, and sometimes it amounts to 80% of uh, parts made of titanium. So the path that we chose, even though we we were actually sold those shares that we had, and that was the right thing to do it back then. But today, we are manufacturing something for Airbus in Varunish, uh, for example. And uh, yesterday, in Tver, if you know Hamilton Standard, this company produces heat exchangers, and uh, they produce them, they manufacture them for Russian industries, for Boeing, Bombardier, and for Embraer. And uh, today, we consider ourselves to be a full-fledged participant of the global industry, of the aerospace industry. That is why we are very open. We are open to anything new. So you can tell your colleagues that we can discuss. You are going to work uh, here then, right? Yes, I wanted to work in uh, Russia as well. Okay, we can find a job for you. 
I promise. Let's work together. Who else? Good afternoon. My name is Roman. I'm a head of uh, one of the departments. And the uh, question is, actually, we are lagging behind the West uh, because our aircraft maintenance is lagging behind. And airlines don't want them. They don't buy them because otherwise, otherwise if uh, there's something wrong with a plane or with an aircraft, there'll be downtime and costs, so on and so forth. Um, any organization, uh, any organizational plans or support? Well, I don't think you should be that general because uh, actually it's about in civil, but in uh, military it's much better. And we have substantial experience in this area, and I heard no complaints, including our own defense industry and armed forces. And actually, for the first time this year, we signed a life cycle contract. So now aircraft and helicopters are operated depending on the life cycle. And uh, the military don't have to think anymore which aircraft must be repaired or must be sent for maintenance or do anything like that. They don't have to think about this anymore because uh, at the moment, uh, speaking about uh, spare parts, everything is in warehouse, everything is in place and available. Speaking about civil aviation, yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, we had a similar question. And I actually know that we already have some challenges and uh, we have a fence to jump over. So we need to, we need to work closely with our colleagues from other countries and hopefully they would help us with the methodology and uh, implementation of cutting edge tools and mechanisms. Speaking about state support, um, annually we have a standalone and independent subsidy for aviation, for United Aviation Corporation well, in first place, and uh, speaking about helicopters, they just started actively using this because they thought that the military market will live forever. It turned out not to be that true. So every year we have, we allocate subsidies for promotion of new equipment and uh, to for establishing warehouses, service centers, and the problems that we are faced with. Well, in response to your question, uh, for example, with respect to the superjet, and you are part of this process, as far as I understand. We have uh, come to understand that um, during operations, uh, being unex inexperienced, we didn't know which parts will wear off first. So we ordered some parts a year and a half ago, and uh, they're currently being manufactured. So we will fill up or top up our warehouses, and uh, this will be in Sheremetyevo as well to improve logistics, just like our just like our colleagues working 24/7, and. Um, I will go to Mexico. There's uh, 20 plus uh, airplanes, 22, and uh, they're quite happy with this air aircraft. And uh, we will discuss procurement of even more aircraft. So we will provide some support, and state support will be ensured. One last question, please. My name is uh, Zverev uh, Alexander Irkut Corporation from Voronezh. Quite recently, Suhoi Corporation and Irkut Corporation merged. Why did this happen, and what can we expect to see? Well, you're working in Voronezh, and uh, uh, well, it's a branch. It's a it's an Irkut branch. Okay. 
Okay, uh, speaking about the merger, at the Board of Directors, the, the decision has been made to follow the example of our foreign colleagues from other countries. And um, we decided to merge all assets. We gathered all the state had and uh, all that the participants had and uh, everyone had its share. And Irkut owner and uh, we exchanged the uh, United uh, Aviation Corporation shares and uh, at the moment so we've done a number of actions and we've addressed a number of technical issues and we've come to understand that we need to create something powerful, a powerful fleet of civil aircraft. So Irkut is one of the most powerful, powerful companies working and dealing with civil aircraft. For example, if we talk about Suhoi civil aircraft experience. All of this will be smoothly integrated or interintegrated. So, speaking about maintenance and uh, services, can you imagine a standalone service uh, support for Irkut and for civil aviation? No money will be enough to do that and to achieve that, and it will be inefficient and economically not viable. So, we decided to go for efficiency and to create something like this. Civil division, transportation divi division, Mr. Korotkov is present here, strategic aviation, combat aviation. Have I missed anything? Yeah, I haven't missed anything. So this is a corporate process and we, it will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for very interesting questions. I wish you every success and I wish that everything that we discussed today, what bothers you, what concerns you, I encourage you to become active participants of all these revolutions, evolutions, processes, and I wish you the best in implementing all this new technology. All the best. Thank you.